Welcome to Listen Here, the audiobook podcast where we bring you chapter listens of our much loved audiobooks and sometimes special guest appearances. Relationships are wonderful until they're not. Is it unloving or selfish to set a boundary? Who hasn't asked this question at least once in their life? New York Times bestselling author Lisa Turkhurst is here to help you stop the dysfunction of unhealthy relationships by showing you biblical ways to set boundaries and, when necessary, say goodbye without losing the best of who you are. Lisa Turkhurst knows that setting boundaries in relationships can be difficult to navigate, and in her latest book, Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, Lisa shares the knowledge and peace she's learned through thousands of hours of counseling intensives and extensive theological research. Lisa is now more committed than ever to loving people well without losing the best of who she is, and she wants to help you do the same. In Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, Lisa will help you understand the five factors to remember when implementing healthy boundaries, determine the appropriate amount of personal and emotional access someone has to you based on how responsible they'll be with that access, stop being misled and emotionally paralyzed by wrongly interpreted or weaponized scriptures that perpetuate unhealthy dynamics in difficult relationships, overcome the frustrating cycle of ineffective boundary setting with realistic scripts and practical strategies that help you communicate, keep, and implement healthier patterns. Be equipped to say goodbye without guilt when a relationship has shifted from difficult to destructive and is no longer sustainable. And receive therapeutic wisdom you can trust directly from Lisa's Christian counselor, Jim Cress, who weighs in throughout the book. She'll help guide readers and listeners through knowing if a relationship is difficult versus destructive, when boundaries can be set to help a relationship thrive, and when it might be time to say goodbye. Keep listening and hear the first few chapters of Good Boundaries and Goodbyes. Faith Gateway is an online community for readers to discover top Christian books and engage with their favorite Christian authors. They bring together content in many different forms, from daily blog posts to book excerpts, daily devotionals, free downloads, videos, giveaways, contests, free online Bible studies, and more. Faith Gateway is brought to you by HarperCollins Christian Publishing, which publishes works from some of the most beloved and most popular Christian authors in the world today. Faith Gateway provides unique opportunities to connect with those authors and their books as you seek answers to your biggest spiritual questions. Whether you are exploring Christianity or involved in full-time Christian ministry, Faith Gateway has the best resources to meet you where you are today and help you get to the next level in your spiritual journey. Faith Gateway is giving Listen Here listeners 15% off their first order with promo code LISTEN. Visit faithgateway.com to shop the store, sign up for daily devotionals, or join the latest free online Bible study. That's faithgateway.com and promo code LISTEN to receive 15% off your first order. I dedicate this message to the courageous woman who will make some hard but very brave decisions to step out of chaos toward health and honesty. I thought about you as I wrote every word of this book. Remember, when you love deeply, you may get hurt deeply. But getting hurt doesn't mean you have to fear closeness with all people. It actually means you have a tremendous capacity to love others really well because you dared to offer another person the most tender depths of your heart. Don't pack love away like an old sweater you never want to wear again. Good boundaries can help you recognize what got unraveled so you can love others without losing the best of who you are. Tucked within these pages are thousands of my tears that dripped into smudges of ink as I promised God that if He would help me live this message, I would write this message, and that I would do everything possible to get this book into your hands. It's such an honor to meet you here. Now, let's get started together. Introduction We Can't Set Good Boundaries Without Love Well, hello. There's so much I want to write in these first words to provide the right environment for this book. I wish I could hand you your favorite coffee, toss you a blanket, set a box of tissues on the table in front of us, 
put on just the right soundtrack and catch up on where we both are in life. I would so much rather talk through this message face-to-face or at least write this to you in a letter in my own handwriting. There's a deeply human element that I don't want to get lost in these black and white pages and words typed and spoken in this audiobook. We're both picking up this book in the middle of real life where we're navigating what works and what doesn't in the relationships we treasure. And because relationships are so very organic, they move like breath in and out of our lungs, expanding with deep connection one minute and in the next minute atrophying in complete misunderstanding. Relationships are wonderful and full of love and frustration and wrought with angst and all the things we bring into every attempted embrace with another person. When those we love draw close to us, they draw close to our issues, and we come face-to-face with their issues as well. And as we open up to each other, the deeper we connect, the more vulnerable we become. The more vulnerable we become, the more exposed the tender places inside of us become. This exposure is risky. When we dare to be so very known, we risk being so very hurt. When we dare to be so very hopeful, we risk being so very disappointed. When we dare to be so very giving, we risk being so very taken advantage of. And when we dare to unnaturally change into what someone else needs, we risk losing ourselves in the process. To love and to be loved is to be enveloped in the safest feeling I've ever known. To cause hurt And to be hurt is to be crushed with the scariest feeling I've ever known. You and I both know this. In different ways and with different people and to varying degrees, we know the multifaceted complications of love and heartbreak. We dream of the best. We dread the worst. And we keep trying to figure out how to do relationships right. We build our lives around those we love. And those we love build their lives around us. We laugh and connect and disconnect and fight and make up and coast and drift and come back and think about how lucky we are to be with someone until we send our counselor the broken heart emoji with the text, need help now, this isn't going well. Or maybe we use other words and emojis we really can't talk about here in this little book. It's not all magical, like the plots of the Hallmark Christmas movies. People in these movies seem to live with the blessing of predictability and things always epically working out right. There's never a need for ongoing boundaries because there are no ongoing hardships. Once the story turns for good, it stays good until the credits roll. Last week, I sent a text to my friends after watching too many of these movies. It was my attempt at correcting these unrealistic plots, and it went like this. Opening scene. Snow falling gently on townspeople smiling, laughing, ice skating. Girl is serving customers in the midst of everyone else's fun. She has an unreasonable, mean boss. She looks out of sorts, like she's searching for something, something just beyond her grasp. Suddenly, a man with a guitar, smug attitude, and unusual fame appears. And he's a secret prince from a far-off land. She spills water on him. He writes her a song. They fall in love. Closing scene, she becomes a princess. But unfortunately, we all know that's unrealistic. Life doesn't tie up in a neat, nice bow. So really, the script should go like this. Opening scene. Same beginning scenario, but she spills water on the guy. He freaks out, doesn't leave a tip, tries to get her fired, and she goes home mumbling about what a jerk he was. Also, his castle is in foreclosure, and soon he's working as a busboy at the same restaurant. She's eventually promoted to manager, becomes independently successful, and she sets boundaries with him because he's being irresponsible in the way he closes out the cash registers each night. Then she makes some discoveries that cause her to fire him because he's stealing from the cash drawer. Closing scene. 
She buys the castle and invites her friends over to process what went wrong with him and how in the world could he steal from her. But then, after the closing scene, she questions herself over and over and still wishes things could have been different. (laughs) Obviously, Hallmark isn't clamoring for me to write for them anytime soon, but I am eager to process what I believe has been the missing piece in the storyline of my relationships for far too long, good boundaries. Now, this is where I want to look straight into your eyes and say something really important. This isn't a book about leaving people. It's a book about loving people in right and healthy ways. It's a book about communicating appropriate boundaries and parameters so that love can stay safe and sustainable. Boundaries aren't meant to shove love away. Quite the opposite. We set boundaries so we know what to do when we very much want to love those around us really well without losing ourselves in the process. Good boundaries help us preserve the love within us, even when some relationships become unsustainable and we must accept the reality of a goodbye. Throughout these pages, we'll seek to honestly examine what is and is not healthy in our hearts, but also in the relationships where we invest our hearts. Sometimes it's difficult to know what's healthy and what's not. So it's important to seek godly counsel and in more complex situations like addictions and abuse, someone specifically trained on the issues at hand. And if this is you, make sure to listen to what we're going to get to at the end of the book, which is called Getting the Help You Need. After all, God's ultimate assignment is for us to love Him and love others. And this is exactly what Jesus taught and modeled. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. John 13, 34. But we can't enable bad behavior in ourselves and others and call it love. We can't tolerate destructive patterns and call it love. And we can't pride ourselves on being loyal and long-suffering in our relationships when it's really perpetuating violations of what God says love is. Please hear me clearly say, the purpose of this book isn't to quickly call out issues in others without looking honestly at ourselves as well. We need to examine our motivations and our mindsets. And this isn't a message that is encouraging people to divorce quickly, thoughtlessly, or unadvisedly. Proverbs 15.22 reminds us that there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. This also isn't a message about encouraging people to abandon others just because things get difficult or the other person is walking through a hard season. But we also don't need to swing the pendulum to the extreme where we stay in a destructive, toxic, or abusive relationship no matter what. Listen for later in the book when we get to some important notes to consider on abuse. Boundaries, as you will soon see, should help us avoid extremes and live closer to the kind of love God intended for relationships. Love must be honest. Love must be safe. Love must seek each other's highest good, and love must honor God to experience the fullness and the freedom of the sweetest connection between two humans. In fact, when I turn to 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, I'm reminded of God's intention for the purest form of love. Here's how I journaled what I want to remember from these scriptures. Love is not dishonorable. Love does not justify wrongs to enable selfishness. Love does not celebrate evil. Love requires truth. Love leads to honor, kindness, and compassion. So as we take this journey, let's remember the real purpose of good boundaries. Boundaries protect the right kind of love and help prevent dysfunction from destroying that love. Boundaries help us say what needs to be said, do what needs to be done, and establish what is and isn't acceptable. Love should be what draws us together, not what tears us apart. And remember, we can't set good boundaries without love. Setting boundaries from a place of anger and bitterness will only lead to control and manipulation. 
Setting boundaries as a punishment will only serve to imprison us. But setting boundaries from a place of love provides an opportunity for relationships to grow deeply because true connection thrives within the safety of health and honesty. I guess my greatest fear in writing this book after an unwanted divorce is that it might seem I'm eager to push others away, but that's not true. I'm more eager than ever before to deeply love the people in my life, and I know how destructive it can be to navigate relationship devastation because of a lack of boundaries. I know what it feels like to be paralyzed by another person's choices that break your heart over and over and not know what to do about it. I know the frustration of saying something has to change but feeling stuck when the other person isn't cooperating with those needed changes. So while some relationships become unsustainable to the point that it's necessary to move beyond a good boundary to a goodbye, you don't have to become someone you were never meant to be. When we're hurt, good boundaries and goodbyes help us to not get stuck in a perpetual state of living hurt. This is a book written to help you discover that good boundaries can pave the road for the truest and purest version of love to emerge within the relationships that make up so much of who we are and what we want the most. As we process good boundaries and learn more about goodbyes throughout this book, I've created a section at the end of each chapter called Now Let's Live This. It's a wrap-up of what we're reading and learning and includes some questions and scriptures to ponder as we go. Remember, this isn't just a message to read. It's one that we'll want to sit with, wrestle through, and process in prayer. And I know you're going to be tempted to want to just speed on past the now let's live this, because if I was doing this book, I would want to do the same. But I want to encourage you, don't do that. Because if we want real transformation, we'll have to take the crucial step of application. This won't be the easiest message to apply in your life, but it will likely be one of the most valuable steps you take toward emotional health and better relationships. And the best part of it all, you won't be alone. I'll be with you as we trust God to lead us through every word and every next step. And... As a special bonus just for you, you'll also hear from my Christian counselor, Jim Cress. He'll be weighing in with therapeutic insights all throughout this book. So I can't wait to do all of this with you. Now, let's live this. Here are some statements that I want you to remember and really cling to. We can't enable bad behavior and call it love. Love must honor God to experience the fullness and the freedom of the sweetest connection between two humans. Boundaries protect the right kind of love and help prevent dysfunction from destroying that love. Love should be what draws us together, not what tears us apart. Setting boundaries from a place of love provides an opportunity for relationships to grow deeply because true connection thrives within the safety of health and honesty. When we're hurt, good boundaries and goodbyes help us to not get stuck in a perpetual state of living hurt. Now, here are some scriptures that I want you to soak in, so receive these. John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, here's some questions to think through. Reflect on these. Have you ever considered that establishing healthy parameters in your relationships is actually an act of love? As you start this book, how does this change your perspective? 
What may have motivated you in the past to set boundaries or say a goodbye? Take time to think this through and then write down your answers. When you're in a relationship where there's been chaos, confusion, and hurt, reacting in extremes can add even more pain. Some people take on all the blame and minimize the actions of the other person. The opposite extreme is to place sole blame on the other person without checking your own heart. Throughout this book, we want to avoid going to either of these extremes. So, honest self-reflection is always a good practice. Asking yourself these questions is a wise step now, and revisiting them before you set a boundary or say a goodbye could also be helpful. Have I set unrealistic expectations? Am I too easily offended? Have I considered my own shortcomings relative to this relationship? Have I sought wisdom from a godly advisor, mentor, or counselor? Now, here's our prayer. Lord, The greatest desire of my heart is to love and treasure others the way you treasure us. But honestly, sometimes these hard relationship dynamics make it incredibly difficult to discern what is truly loving. So as I turn these next pages, I ask that you guide me and help me to walk in your ways, not mine. Show me how to approach my closest relationships with both compassion and a healthy commitment to reality, so I am in alignment with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 1. You are not crazy. You can love them, but you can't change them. You cannot build trust that keeps getting broken. Those words were coming to me in impossible waves of grief, bumping into the still raw places of my heart. I waffled from wanting to scream those words to wanting to take them back and swallow them whole. Before this moment, I'd only been able to write them in my journal. But then, in an unplanned moment of stinging honesty, I spoke them out loud, first to my counselor and then later to the man I'd been married to for nearly three decades. You cannot build trust that keeps getting broken. It was a gut punch. It can be awful to speak the truth sometimes, and yet it is much more awful to have the truth staring you in the face and deny it. I loved him. I treasured our long talks processing life and love and even all the everyday stuff that builds close connection. Back when things were normal, I assumed this relationship would always be a big part of my life. But then things started to change, deteriorate and flip everything upside down. Lies became more common than truth. Second chances turn into third and fourth and 50th chances to right the wrongs with truth. Promises were made, and for a season, promises were kept. But just when I thought we were getting somewhere, promises were broken. The problem is that trust is an incredibly fragile thing to rebuild. The setbacks are cruel. Unexpected sprains are debilitating, and if twisted backward to the point of fracture, the splinters of trust broken over and over are daggers to the heart. Every bit of me wanted our marriage to be healthy and thriving, and yet everything about reality demanded that changes be made. The addictions were back, and so were the violations of clearly established boundaries. I could not ignore it or pretend to be okay with it. Every time I saw new evidence, I recoiled both from the pain inside my chest and the piercing flashbacks in my brain. My counselor calls these triggers. Each time I was triggered, I was transported back to the time when I didn't understand addictions. I didn't understand that good people can do really bad things when addictions take over. I thought I was going crazy. Seeing evidence of the addictions again screamed terrorizing warnings. You aren't safe. It's happening again. Everything is a lie. You're about to get blindsided. You won't survive this. I shook my head. My body folded in half and sobs erupted from the depths of my being. I had given every bit of love and forgiveness I knew to give and it wasn't enough. Love given is wildly beautiful. 
Love received is wildly fulfilling. But for love to thrive as true and lasting, it must be within the safety of trust. Without trust, love will die. So I had to say it. You cannot build trust that keeps getting broken. And as I let those words out, I felt as if I was declaring one of the worst defeats of my life. I had the wrong notion that to be a Christian requires that we believe the best no matter what, that it's unkind to draw boundaries, that it's noble and commendable to stay in a relationship no matter what. I no longer believe any of that. I now believe we must honor what honors God. And in doing so, we must not confuse the good commands to love and forgive with the bad realities of enabling and covering up things that are not honoring to God. When someone's dishonorable actions beg us not to stay, this should give us serious pause. My counselor, Jim Cress, once held up a pillow between my face and his own. He said, When you are speaking to this person— Everything you say must pass through the addictions first. You aren't talking to the person you love. I knew Jim was right. I kept trying to have a conversation with the irrationality of substances that could only allow me to either be the enabler or the enemy. The enabler will be manipulated. The enemy will be lied to. Either way, There is no love in manipulation and lies. Love breathes the oxygen of trust. Love struggles and eventually becomes strangled in the oxygen-depleted grapple of addictions. Though I wasn't the one choosing the addictive substances, I was the one now drawing a line that could not be crossed another time. But deep down, I knew the boundary would be crossed just as it had so many times before. The seduction of his many addictions had so captured him that I now knew I wasn't really talking to the man I loved. His eyes were the same shape I'd looked into countless times, but his truest self was not there. He could not see what I was seeing. He would not hear what I was saying. Though we were only a few feet apart, there was a chasm between us. Health cannot bond with unhealth. I want to say that sentence again because I think it's so important. Health cannot bond with unhealth. So either I had to get unhealthy and enable the cycle to continue, or I had to follow through with the boundaries we had agreed upon. In a time of renewal, we had written out what would and would not be acceptable in our relationship moving forward. And now the realities of those broken vows were a crushing blow. I hadn't wanted to admit that the addictions were surfacing and spiraling again. To admit that would force me to make the choice to once again turn this man I loved over to his choices. To stop the madness, I would have to let go of his hand, let go of what had been such a big part of my life, stop myself from stepping in to rescue him over and over and then remind myself to breathe a thousand painful and fearful breaths every single day. I knew at some point I would stare at my face in the mirror and wonder, but what if I rescued him this time and it finally turned everything around? Or what if I don't rescue him and something terrible happens? Will I regret this for the rest of my life? Is there anything else I can do? Yet, because of all the wise counsel I had gotten, there was nothing else to do, and it felt like a shameful defeat to me. It's hard to own what you don't choose. I knew I shouldn't own the repercussions of addictions that weren't mine, but when your life is so tightly woven into a collective fabric of a close relationship, it can be excruciatingly maddening to watch someone choose things you know are destructive. Though their choices are their own, the consequences have an impact on everyone who loves them. Much like exploding hand grenades, you don't have to be the one to pull the pin to be deeply devastated by the resulting shrapnel. 
You can't reason with the person caught in the addiction cycle any more than you can try to talk a live grenade out of exploding. When the pin is pulled, a chain of events is set off that creates destruction. Most people struggling with addictions will have irrational justifications that will never make sense. They don't factor in others. They truly think their choices only affect them. They don't feel your heartbreak. They don't want to see your tears. They will tell you that the blue sky is orange, that the orange car is green, that their glass is full of one thing when you absolutely know it's something else. And when their lies hit you without even a twitch of remorse from them, you wonder if any truth exists between you at all. If you go with what they say, you'll become more and more convinced you're the problem. If you oppose what they say, they will make sure you feel you are definitely the problem. Either way, you lose. And I was losing. My health, my emotional well-being, and even if I didn't want to admit it, my marriage. So now, the only real choice I had to make was whether or not to lose with my sanity intact. Now, I realize that more severe issues like addiction may not be what's making some of your relationships incredibly challenging. There are so many reasons relationships can start to slip from being healthy to unhealthy, or at least from fulfilling to frustrating. Relationships are wonderful until they're not. But most of us aren't nearly as equipped as we need to be to know what to do when we know things need to change, but the other person isn't willing to or capable of cooperating with the needed changes. Or your challenge may be with a great person and you can't figure out how to address something that is bothering you or how to communicate the need for a boundary. Or it may be with a person in authority over you and boundaries don't feel like they would work. Or it's with a family member who lives in your home, and though you need some distance, setting a boundary doesn't feel very realistic. All relationships can be difficult at times, but they should not be destructive to our well-being. If you have relationships in your life where you know something is wrong, but you can't for the life of you figure out what to do, I believe you'll quickly find the reason you need this book. I understand what it feels like to have your body tense and your pulse quicken while your mind is screaming at the other person. Stop doing this. You've prayed about this behavior or situation. You've talked about this. You've tried to navigate it. You may have even tried to stop it. But in the end, nothing has worked. You've reached a place where you know you can forgive the person and you can love them. You want to save the relationship and get to a better place more than anything. You've made the changes. You've listened to the wise advice and done everything you know to do. But you finally realized if they don't want things to change, you cannot change them. And now you're secretly wondering if you're the crazy one. Friend, You may be brokenhearted. You may be sad. You may be afraid and possibly angry. You may be focused on trying to fix what isn't within your ability to fix. You may even be fixated on trying to figure everything out. But you are not crazy. If you are smelling smoke, there is fire. And the only reasonable option at this point is to either put out the fire or get yourself out. Out of the fire. Drawing boundaries can help put out fires before they become all consuming. But if the fire keeps burning with increasing intensity, you've got to get away from the smoke and flames. Sometimes your only option is to say goodbye. I hope you'll soon see that boundaries aren't just a good idea, they are a God idea. Boundaries are woven into everything God has done since the very beginning. We'll get to that in the coming chapters. But think about this for now. 
God even put an actual boundary around the sea during creation. The sea would eventually be known to people who lived during biblical times as a symbol of chaos. So the boundary for the sea was a barrier of sand placed by God that the chaos was not allowed to cross. See Jeremiah 5.22. Where there is an abundance of chaos, there is usually a lack of good boundaries. Chaos shouldn't be the norm, and while we can't always change the source of the chaos, we must tend to what we can change. Please know, it's not unchristian to set these healthy parameters. It's not unchristian to require people to treat you in healthy ways and for us to do the same for others. It's not unchristian to call wrong things wrong and hurtful things hurtful. We can do it all with honor kindness, and love, but we have to know how to spot dysfunction, what to do about it, and when to recognize it's no longer reasonable or safe to stay in some relationships. Like the other books I've written, this is a message I need most of all. I'm still challenged by setting and keeping boundaries. I've come to understand that boundaries aren't a method to perfect, but rather an opportunity to protect what God intended for relationships. I need that, and I imagine you might too. And we'll also take a look at goodbyes. We all have relationships that didn't last like we thought they would, but most of us find these endings incredibly confusing and sometimes crushing. Maybe you've wondered, like me, if it's even possible for a goodbye to be good at all. If you have questions and hesitations about all of this, you're not alone. With God's help in my own tear-filled wrestling through this message, I have found a way forward, a way to truly love others without losing the best of who I am. I want to acknowledge up front that this journey of setting and keeping healthy boundaries won't always be easy. We'll have to examine some hard places of dysfunction, distress, and even distrust. We'll have to commit to wake up each day with a renewed commitment to assess our boundaries and how we're going to be sure to adhere to them with equal measures of grace, love, and compassion for ourselves, and for the ones we're in relationship with. Compassion is really important to me when I'm processing boundaries. When we're in a difficult relationship, or even one that isn't sustainable, especially if addictions are involved, there does need to be a measure of compassion. Because sometimes what is actually driving unhealthy behaviors in people is underlying shame or a lack of peace deep inside. Many times, it's both. What I'm not saying is that because of compassion, we condone or enable their actions or stay in situations where there's harm being done. But what I am saying is that as we take a step back, we can consider having compassion for whatever caused the original root of shame and chaos in their heart that then drove them to try to act and react in such unhealthy ways. We don't want the hurt they've caused to make us betray who we really are. We aren't cruel or mean-spirited, so we don't want to bring any of that into our boundary setting. I also want to have compassion because I don't have life so figured out that I never act and react in unhealthy ways. I have my own issues that I need to work on and work through with counseling. And certainly, learning to have compassion appropriately while still also having boundaries continues to be one of my biggest lessons. So, if you're ready to work through this, and I mean really work through all of this, then I am too. We're in this together, and there's no one else I'd rather have by my side as we press in and make progress toward the healing and health our hearts are desperately aching for. And with that, I think I'll take a deep breath and go grab another cup of coffee. With great hope in my heart, I'll tuck my Bible under my arm as I walk alongside you. Now, here's a note from my counselor, Jim Cress, on triggers. There are two types of triggers, internal and external. 
A trigger is a stimulation caused either by an internal thought or an external action from someone else. Whether internal or external, the trigger causes a reaction that makes a painful incident from the past feel as if it's happening in the present. It's almost as if we've been transported back to the scene of the crime. The feeling part of our brain, known as the limbic system, is wired to search for safety and confidence in what the future holds. In other words, the brain is trying to predict what will happen next. So a trigger makes you anxious because it sets off an alarm, making you feel something isn't right or safe. But the trigger is not the main issue. The main issue is the unhealed trauma still inside you. When you get triggered, it's pointing either to something from your past not yet healed inside you or a new trauma happening in the present moment. If a fresh trauma is happening and you're in immediate danger, your desire will be to get to safety. If the trigger is because of past trauma, we can learn how to not get hijacked by the anxiety. This will require you to go into your past to work on what's still not healed while also staying grounded. Stop. Take a breath and say, I know what's going on here. I've been here before. I'm not in immediate danger. There is a way out and I can seek help. I can let this feeling inform me, but I don't have to spiral into panic. And no matter the trigger, Always remember you have the power to rise in resiliency. When things around you get out of control, you can call a timeout. You can remove yourself. You can seek others to help you process. You can get a plan. You can schedule something on your calendar to look forward to. All these things will help you avoid spinning in the unsafe feelings and circumstances that are causing you pain and confusion. Now, let's live this. Remember, you cannot build trust that keeps getting broken. We must not confuse the good commands to love and forgive with the bad realities of enabling and covering up things that are not honoring to God. Health cannot bond with unhealth. All relationships can be difficult at times, but they should not be destructive to our well-being. Boundaries aren't just a good idea, they are a God idea. Where there is an abundance of chaos, there is usually a lack of good boundaries. It's not unchristian to require people to treat you in healthy ways. Now, here's some scriptures I want us to receive. Now, remember when I mentioned Jeremiah 5.22? Let me read that to you. I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. Now, here's some questions to reflect on, and you may want to grab a journal to process these. Describe what you think when you hear this. You cannot build trust that keeps getting broken. And... In what ways have you believed it was unchristian to require others to treat you in healthy ways? Now, here's a prayer as we wrap up chapter 1. Heavenly Father, when the person who hurts me doesn't see the heartbreak, tears, or emotions they are causing, I know you do. You remind me that I am seen and loved. I am not walking alone. As I start the journey of discovering how boundaries are not just a human idea, but your idea, I know you will guide me every step of the way. Keep my heart tender and humble while at the same time steadfast and open to all you reveal to me. Continue to show me what you have for me personally in the pages ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for spending time with us, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen Here. Check back next week for more audiobook samples and maybe a special guest or two. Follow us wherever you listen to podcasts or find us on Instagram and TikTok at Listen Here Podcast and visit our website, listenherepodcast.com for more information or to find the books we've talked about.